Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have a special guest with us today. Can you please tell us who you are? I'm uh, Tracy Rowland from the University of Notre Dame, Australia. Excellent. And we're going to be reflecting on Pope Benedict uh, the Sixteenth. So to start, can I just ask you, he wrote a book about the introduction to Christianity, and I'm yes. told a rather dense book. <laughs> yes, you, it is. Can you give us an idea of some of the things he focused on or how he introduced Christianity to people? Sure. Um, well, the first thing I would say to people is if you are interested in the thought of uh, Pope Benedict, do not begin with the Introduction to Christianity book because it's really not an introduction. <laughs> uh, it is, as you said, a very dense book. Uh, it was his best-selling book and uh, it was translated into some large number of languages, I think some number over 10. And it was, it was written uh, in 1968, or at least published in 1968, that sort of cultural watershed year of the 20th century. And so really in that book, he tries to defend a belief in what we would call creed or Christianity against all sort of all manner of uh, philosophical attacks, largely German philosophical attacks on creed or Christianity. So he, he goes through um, a number of propositions taken from the creed and, and tries to defend them uh, against German philosophical attacks. And, and so you do need to have a bit of a background in German philosophy to be able to, to follow the argumentation. And how does the book look now when you read it in sort of 21st century? Look, I, I think it has lost none of its relevance because I think we're still dealing with, um, you know, we're still dealing with the German Enlightenment. We're still dealing with Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, we're still dealing with the influence of different forms of Marxism. And so in that book, he he's contending with all of those different philosophical traditions. And I would say that today they are even more powerful, perhaps, than what they were in 1968. Was there any area that he gave a lot of emphasis to, like the big threats or the ones he really wanted to, to, to go at? I, I think he wanted to defend the fact that, that it's perfectly okay uh, to, to believe that, you know, that, that, that Jesus Christ was the second person of the Trinity, is the second person of the Trinity, uh, that he did become incarnate of a virgin and that it's not irrational to believe that Christianity is the truth, you know, not just another wisdom to tradition on the smorgasbord of wisdom traditions, but it is actually the truth. And, and, and he, really, he really strongly defended that proposition. And I heard that during his time, he did work with the Anglicans and got a bit of backlash from that. Can you tell us a bit about that? Um, well, the first thing I'd say is that outside of the United Kingdom, the place where St. John Henry Newman is most popular is Germany. And in the first half of the 20th century, Newman was translated into German. And then during the Second World War, many of the resistance groups in Germany based their intellectual resistance on John Henry Newman's ideas on conscience. So, so for example, um, in Munich, there was this group called the White Rose Movement, and the leaders of that were um, Sophie Scholl and her brother Hans, and, and they ended up being beheaded by the Nazis for their opposition. But they they really um, were inspired uh, to resist fascism by reading Newman's sermons, especially his work on on conscience. And so Benedict as a bar, as a Bavarian, you know, was was like an intellectual heir to that intellectual tradition. And he was, you know, he was very keen to, to do something to help those members of the Anglican communion who were intellectually Catholic, 
but culturally, um, you know, culturally they were English and, and they loved the, the Anglican liturgy and they did not feel at home in, you know, in Catholic parishes, which were perhaps, you know, um, culturally very Irish. You know, they, 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 the, the cultural divide was, was really quite a barrier for them. And uh, Benedict doesn't have a problem with cultural plurality. Uh, for him, the important thing is that people believe the same principles. They, they, they have the same faith. But if they want different cultural expressions of that faith, then for him that wasn't a problem. And so what he tried to do for, for Anglicans who were intellectually very much at the Catholic end of the Anglican spectrum, and as you know, the Anglican church is a broad church with a kind of Calvinist wing at one end and a Catholic wing at the other and then people in the middle. So he was, he was trying to do something for the Catholics uh, and he created what was called an ordinariate which is a you know a special canonical structure within the church, uh, so that members of the Anglican Church could be could enter into full communion with Catholics, uh, but bring a lot of their cultural baggage with them, especially their beautiful liturgy, and and he did that, and yes, it did create um, a lot of backlash. Uh, he he did cop a lot of flack for doing that. And what was the backlash related to? They just didn't want him to do that at all or there were aspects of it that they didn't like? Well, the Anglicans he helped were the sort of people who didn't want the ordination of women and who were feeling quite marginalised within the Anglican church because of that. And so for the liberals in the Catholic church who want the ordination of women um, and other you know, changes in doctrine and teaching, um, the Liberals just saw it as Benedict shoring up the numbers in the Catholic Church against policies or um, movements like the ordination of women. Now, Pope Benedict talked a lot about um, Africa or had views mm -hmm. on the African Church. Can you tell us what some of those views were? Well, I think he was, you know, he, he was very, um, very positive about Africa. You know, Africa is a place where the church has been less influenced by the negative influences that come out of German philosophical traditions than parts of the first world or parts of, you know, the so-called Western world. Um, it's a country where family life is highly respected, highly valued. Um, and the church is growing in Africa. And he had, you know, towards the end of his life, he had a very close personal friendship with Cardinal Robert Zara, who is from Guinea. Uh, and, and Cardinal Zara is a man who uh, came from a family that, that were pagans. They were you know, they, they had some tribal religion that was pre-Christian. And uh, Cardinal Zara at one time in his life was being tracked by Marxist guerrilla groups trying to assassinate him. He's a, he's a really interesting character, Robert, Robert Zara. And, um, you know, he's, he, he's just kind of like Africa's Leonine Cardinal. And he and Pope Benedict uh, became close in, in the last decade of Benedict's life. And I think, I think in general, you know, Benedict thought that Africa could be the hope of the church in the 21st century. And do you think that's correct, a correct assessment to say that it... Um, well, look, I don't think it's the only place of hope, but I think certainly it is one place of hope, yes. I mean, if you look at the, the old Catholic countries of Europe, they're in quite a mess. Um, you know, the, the numbers of those practicing the faith in places like Belgium and Germany are just completely abysmal. The situation is much better in France uh, and also in the countries that were formerly part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And most of those were on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. 
Most of those were, you know, experienced four decades of Soviet oppression. Uh, so when you try and sell Marxism to people from those countries, they've been inoculated against it. Um, so the situation is somewhat better there. Can you talk a little bit about his views on liberation theology? Mm, yes. Well, the first point to be made there is that liberation theology was made in Germany and and also to some degree in Belgium. So it's seen to be a Latin American phenomenon, but what happened was that in the 1960s and the 1970s, the leading scholars from Latin America were sent to European universities to do their doctorates. And they picked up Marxism at the European universities and took it back to Latin America and so then you get this development of liberation theology, which um, starts to try and synthesize elements of Christian belief with elements of Marxist social theory. And I should say there's not one version of liberation theology. Different countries in Latin America had their own version. And significantly in Argentina, uh, and Pope Francis, of course, is an Argentinian. Um, it wasn't so much Marxism that was the partner for Catholic theology, but um, Peronist ideas about social issues. So you end up with a, a range of different liberation theologies, but what they all tend to have in common is this notion of the priority of praxis or in theological language, we say that um, ethos is more important than logos, or um, practices take priority over beliefs. And Ratzinger strongly opposed that principle. And so did the great theologian Romano Guardini, uh, who was a professor at the University of Munich uh, during Ratzinger's time as a student. And Guardini, you know, he, he has whole chapters of books saying uh, logos must always precede ethos. And, and that principle is something that got seared into the mind of the young Joseph Ratzinger. And um, when he wrote about liberation theology, he, you know, he was extremely critical of this priority of praxis principle. He wasn't opposed to the Catholic Church trying to do something to help people who were really quite oppressed. And he comes out of the tradition of German Catholic social teaching. Uh, and that includes notions like a common good. You know. So he, he wasn't opposed to the idea of the church trying to help the poor in Latin America or the poor in the Philippines but he didn't think that um, pairing theological teachings with Marxian style social theory was a good way forward. When he was Pope, did he change the church? Um, well, I, I think that, you know, you get into discussions about what is the church, um, but, you know, he, he was a man who thought that Christ gave to the disciples what we call a deposit of the faith. And that that is something, having come from Christ, we can't tamper with. No one has the authority to play with that. Um, no one has the authority to do anything that's contrary to something we learn in the scriptures, for example. Uh, so he just, he sees, he saw the papacy as something like a constitutional monarchy, not an absolute monarchy. In a constitutional monarchy, you have conventions that circumscribe the behaviour of the monarch. Uh, in the case of the papacy, he would say that both scripture and tradition circumscribe what a pope can do. And the style of his papacy was very much that of a university professor using his position to teach the faith, you know, to remind people of what Christianity 101 is. 
And he, you know, he also talked a lot in his Wednesday audience addresses about who the 12 apostles were, where did they go, what did they do, um, who were the early church fathers, what did they teach, what can we learn from them today. And he inspired a whole generation, I think, of young clergy and young laity. And so when we talk about his legacy, um, his legacy is an intellectual legacy. And, you know, what he did, I think, if, you know, in terms of changing the church, what he did was to give young Catholics a whole treasury of homilies, books, articles, to help them um, navigate their way through the current culture. Has he publicly reflected on his time as Pope and mistakes that he made or things he wish he had done or things that he was proud of? Not really. I think he's not. He, he's, he was always a very shy man and I think that sort of public reflection would be a bit too egocentric for his way of thinking. Um, he never, he certainly, you know, he certainly made comments to the effect that he never regretted uh, resigning, you know, that he thought that really was spiritually the best thing to do. Um, I think, you know, I think one can say that, that he was a scholar pope and a brilliant scholar pope. Some people say he was he has been one of the most brilliant men ever to occupy the Petrine office. Um, but he himself would say, and certainly said in some early interviews, you know, um, politics and administration is not my forte. You know, um, obviously he understood there were problems in the Curia. Uh, there was a lot of corruption in the Curia, and I think he didn't have any real idea of how to deal with that. You know, the people people have different skills, and um, his his were almost all in the intellectual realm. You mentioned him resigning. Can you talk a little bit about that moment, the reaction from people within and outside the church? Hmm. Well, I, I think it was uh, like shocking in the in the in the literal sense of that word that that people were shocked uh, because popes, you know, have not for centuries um, resigned. Uh, so I, I think it was, you know, people talk about where were you when Kennedy died. <laughs> uh, I, I think that there's also a question: where were you when you heard that Benedict had resigned? It, it was quite a moment. Um, but, uh, you know, my thoughts at that time, I, I was in Canada, um, there, I was there to, to, um, to give a lecture and my thoughts were, well, you know, he, he just feels as though there are, there's work to be done, especially in the context of the reform of the Curia, that's not his skill set. You know, the, the most prudent thing he can do, the best thing he can do for the church at the moment is to resign and hope that someone else with, you know, with another set of gifts can, can take over and, and manage those issues. Um, so at the time, I wasn't disturbed about it. I just thought, no, he's been perfectly reasonable. And, and what were some of the things he, he did afterwards? He just continued with the intellectual work? Yes, well, you know, he he was by then a very elderly man and he lived in a monastery and he spent his days in prayer and also um, he did do a little bit of writing, not anything really extensive. You know, he wasn't pumping out a book every year or anything like that. But from time to time he would publish small pieces and there were universities that were honouring him with honorary doctorates, and so he might write, you know, a thousand words to, to, to accept the honorary doctorate. And in those one thousand words, um, he would make, you know, some really interesting points. So there is a collection um, 
uh, of his post uh, resignation uh, publications and you know you can you can read those to see what he was interested in i think one of the key things that was of interest to him at that time was what he would call the, the crisis within the catholic priesthood and uh, he and uh, Cardinal Robert Sarr collaborated on a book where they defended the notion of priestly celibacy. And there is a new book to come out um, by Cardinal Robert Sarr about Pope Benedict. It's at the printers at the moment. And uh, in that book, he says that Joseph Ratzinger's had like within his spirituality, he had a deep sense of the fatherhood of God um, and that his understanding of God the Father within the whole you know, economy of salvation influenced his understanding of the priesthood. And for him, the priest you know, is a paternal figure. Uh, not not some bureaucrat, not some gender neutral social worker, you know, but but really a father, um, and so that's that's certainly something interesting. Can you tell me a little bit more about the doctor of the church and mm -hmm. why you think Benedict yeah. could be a doctor? Um, well, in the Catholic Church, there's there are people who are declared to be saints, but then there is a sub category with among those who are saints um, who are also declared to be church doctors. Now I can't remember whether we have 36 or 37 church doctors, but but some number between 35 and 40 church doctors. And these are people who are not only saints, but they're people who contributed to the resolution of some kind of theological crisis in the life of the church. Uh, and many of them come from the, the period of the early church. Many of them are the so-called early church fathers, people like Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, uh, the Gregories. They, they're people who had to contend with, you know, huge intellectual crises about the nature of the Trinity, for example. Uh, and then you get the, the great medieval uh, theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, um, St. Bonaventure. And then more recently, um, St. John Paul II declared St. Therese of Lejeune to be a doctor of the church. And that raised a lot of eyebrows uh, because she wasn't an academic. And around the same time as he declared Therese of Lejeune to be a doctor of the church, he declared St. Therese Benedicta of the Cross to be one of the patron saints of Europe. And Teresa Benedicta of the Cross was an intellectual, you know. And so people were saying, why didn't he flip it? Why didn't he make Teresa of Lejeune um, a patron saint of, of Europe? And Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, a church doctor. But St. John Paul II said that while Teresa of Lejeune was not, wasn't an academic, um, her spirituality was, the solution uh, to a spiritual crisis in the church. So, um, so in terms of Benedict, uh, I'm I'm not the only person who has said that Benedict will one day be a church doctor. Um, others are now making the same claim, and I think it's precisely because his legacy is this intellectual treasury, which does you know, help to navigate people through the current implosion of Western civilization and the Christian component and the, also the Greek component of that civilization. One of the factors about Benedict is that he spent almost as much time defending, uh, you know, the Greek belief in reason um, as he did defending the divinity of Jesus Christ. Um, he he was he was absolutely appalled by the idea that within our Western universities we now have academics attacking the very belief in this.
Can you uh, briefly reflect on some of the things he did with the uh, Jewish people, his, his yeah. work in that area? Yeah. Well, he, he, was, he was a man who loved scripture and he, he, he was of, strongly of the belief that um, the Old Testament prefigures the New Testament and that if you are a Christian, um, your faith is informed by both Testaments, not just by the New Testament. And he had, you know, I think a great love of um, the Jewish intellectual tradition and appreciation of what the Jews had given to the world. And at Vatican II, um, there was a lot of soul-searching reflection about the relationship between Christianity and Judaism because of the horror of World War II. And uh, both in the document Lumen Gentium on the nature of the church and in the, doctor, in the uh, document Nostre Aetate, there were references to uh, the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. And the principle that emerged from Vatican II was um, what's called the irrevocability doctrine, the idea that um, the promise made by God to Abraham has never been revoked. And um, now uh, many of our theologians are, you know, are writing books about precisely what does that mean um, concretely in terms of the relationship between the two traditions. And Benedict was someone who strongly affirmed the proposition that uh, the promises made to Abraham have never been revoked. Thank you so much for joining us for this. You're very welcome. <laughs>